an early season crop of mushrooms, some late spring blossoms, and a garden tour on Garden Street, where a Duluth couple has been bringing up blooms for 50 years. That's all on this edition of Great Gardening, straight ahead. We grow a lot of carrots. People don't realize they can grow mountain laurel here. A lot of gardeners treat their gardens like art projects. We rely on bees for the food that we eat. Well, its common name is Angel's Trumpet. Gardening is definitely my quiet, quiet time. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. This time we see how to grow mushrooms on logs and answer a wide array of garden questions from northern growers. I'm Pamela Fish, along with horticulturist and educator Bob Olin and garden professional Deb Burns Erickson. Thanks for being back here on what, you know, would have been the end of our season, but we got snowed out in April, two months ago. So this is our makeup show. And what happened this week? Frost. 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 <laughs> what? What? <laughs> it's really yeah, unusual. After June 10th. Bob. Yeah, I've, <laughs> I, I've always been <laughs> criticized. I, I've told people, mm -hmm. wait until June 10th. So I waited, gave it an extra day. I waited until June 11th, and I promptly froze on mm -hmm. June 12th. Yep. Just a few of the plants, peppers and eggplants, yep. super yeah. sensitive, some of the tomatoes. But mm -hmm. So that's and all up in part Zim, of the same some thing. Three yeah. times, three times a charm. Down, <laughs> done, out. <laughs> out. Three times mm -hmm. this week you saw frost. We did. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And this that's is late. So I mean, even for us, it's late. It is yeah. late. Yeah. So, so much for global warming, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, if you get a little lake effect, though, you can be fortunate because mm -hmm. you get some mm -hmm. protection. Certainly, and those temperatures didn't get anywhere near freezing down no. near the lake, but they did have frost warnings out, and uh, they came true for some of us. And there's yeah. still a lot of season left. Oh. Yes. Okay. And, and Lots of time to just replant, start over. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Lots of time. <laughs> okay, well, we also want to welcome and thank our phone volunteers from the Duluth Garden Flower Society's Mount Royal Club. They will take your called in questions at 218 788 2844 or toll free 877 307 8762. You can also email askgardening at wdse.org. Well, Bob, there were some gorgeous things out. Um, blooming this week yes. and those are our signs of the season that um, you took pictures of this is just a, a fabulous azalea yeah, that's northern lights and uh and you talk about a riot, a riot of color and these yeah. were, these photos that i took they were all adjacent in one part of the neighborhood in duluth and i just kept snapping this is the mollus azalea mm -hmm. beautiful mm -hmm. yeah with that real deep orange mm -hmm. blooming right next lilacs to the lilacs right now yes and then mm -hmm. what really shocked me, beautiful lilacs again, and was uh, pleased to find this, a radiant crab, which is one of our most beautiful uh, and hardy crabs. And um, once again, crab in the background, or foreground, and then lilacs in the background, and, uh, and some of the allium chives uh, species there in bloom all at the same time. And this is what surprised me, right adjacent, there was a forsythia, they yes, come so early in the season. they usually come mm -hmm. so early. So now I've got a forsythia right next to an, a late azalea and everything's in bloom. So there was this compression that happened this season mm -hmm. with all the snow we had and you speak of the makeup. I think makeup you said type. that was a dolgo crab. It's a dolgo, yeah, yeah. beautiful, beautiful Wait. crab. And then the bumblebee on the azalea. Yeah, awesome. I just happened to catch that guy and they really uh, do love those azaleas uh, so that's anything surprising. that's uh, and this is a close-up of the radiant crab again the, our landscapes right at this moment are just beautiful, beautiful. they're gorgeous mm -hmm. yes. yeah mm -hmm. the and what do we attribute that to I mean is it because we've waited for it for so long and then they just look that much <laughs> more beautiful or it's so cold I mean the cold does intensify the colors sometimes it does okay. and we've got mm -hmm. a little, lot of light right now and we mm -hmm. had those cold temperatures that kind of held everything back and then everything kind of exploded so All that at once plenty of moisture too so that helps and last fall we had plenty of moisture when the flower buds <laughs> being set so which helped a lot, I'm sure. It so we help, uh, yeah. normally don't see all this different array of blooms coming at the same that time. That forsythia. I, and that people yeah. would probably give up on it, say something's wrong with their forsythia, and here it comes. Took so a long, be patient. Yeah, it took a long time. Usually they break so early. It's the first flush of color mm -hmm. that you see. And, and a lot of them, the earlier varieties, probably are gone. But some of the later varieties were blooming at the same time at some of our later mm -hmm. spring flowering mm -hmm. trees were. So it's kind of fun. Interesting, interesting uh, phenomena. Okay, well, we also saw um, that there was some damage done 
last week that we talked about on the left side. Tell us what happened there again, Bob. Yeah, I, I, I photographed these same plants four days apart, just to show you now. On the left, we had all the white leaves, and this was not a virus or a fungus, which a lot of people suspected based on their internet searches. It's just cold shock, you know. We had three or four nights when it was relatively cool. But if that growing tip in the center is still lush and green, Four days later, that same, these are cukes, that same cuke just had exploded out, and it's gonna be just fine. You can see the white leaves have kind of diminished. The same thing with a couple of the tomatoes in the same location. On the left, it looked pretty scrawny. Everything just exploded out within about four days, so things can change very, very rapidly as temperatures improve. The key, Deb, really is that growing tip. It is, it is, and even like for vegetative plants, the coleus is one of the most cold sensitive, and if they get below 45 degrees, the plant itself it can either just bolt and go to seed or do nothing and just it'll just shut down. Right. So 45 40. seems to be. And there it is, there's a coleus mm -hmm. in front yeah. of us which is looking great. Right. But um, people need to be cautious when they yeah. put them out because coleus, they can go down really quickly and um, consider protecting them a lot longer than you would some of the other things. And one other thing, you know, we talk about 32, everyone focuses on 32, but uh, you mentioned 40 or 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. I think the same thing is true of actually the, what we call the primordial bud on uh, tomatoes, tomatoes yeah. where they're just beginning to form if they get cold shock. So I think delaying a little bit, keeping the plants healthy, but delaying setting them out, mm -hmm. Probably not a bad idea. But the tomatoes eventually should come. They will. They'll set them. Well, set them way July. back. Yeah. We'll have them. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is Some one. blooms. Yes, we, <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> okay, um, let's take a few questions. We uh, have a couple of, of them here. And one, Deb, was um, with reference to what you did for us last week. Oh, with the week. petunia. So you pruned that petunia mm -hmm. uh, July 5th, yep. cut it all back, said it'll flush for you, come great. back again in mm -hmm. August. Well, we got a question from Mary in Washburn. She's wondering about whether or not that would work for a lobelia. So lobelia, there's two types. There's a new uh, hot series that can take the heat. Now, if it's the vegetative hot series or California series, you can give them a haircut. They'll flush back and they'll do well. But if it's one of the seed varieties, they're just running their cycle. And that is their season to just shut down in the middle heat. And then they may come back a bit in the spring or a fall, but um, it depends on the variety, but it would work for, for the hot lobelia. Lobelia, yeah. Okay. All right, Mary also was wondering about her white lilac bush, which is about 17 years old. It does have blooms, but very few leaves. And it, she's wondering why that is. She, she cuts the finished blooms off when they turn brown. Anything else she should be doing? Well, I really think, you know, they get woody. Those stems mm -hmm. get woody. And I, th I think lilacs, after they've matured and flowered once, after the bloom, not only taking off the spent bloom, you should really cut them back at that point. Take really some of the woody, woody material Absolutely. so that we just don't have this little crown of leaves in the top and a lot of woody material that won't flush mm -hmm. out the further down. Especially the vulgaris ones, yeah. Yes. So the trick is to prune it a little harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every year just prune a little bit annually, mm -hmm. uh, take off not just the bloom, but take down some of that vegetative material and that, that helps renovate the plant. Okay, great. Um, Chris from Duluth wonders how often and when I should fertilize my lawn. Now, there is a good question. That, that kind of depends on who you, who <laughs> who you, you are and, what, and who yeah. you are yeah, and what, you're, what, you want to do, what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Trying to accomplish. I would say for most folks where we have low nitrogen soils, you can get by with one application in the fall. September is the best time, really, because our, our bluegrasses are spreading out rhizomes at that time. But I would say a lot of people would like to maybe flush it up, flush it up in the mm -hmm. spring, mm -hmm. and that would be, I tell people, we'll mow it once, and then you can apply your, your fertilizer. And then if you're not irrigating, you don't want any fertility in mid-season, and then in the fall. So two to four times a year, depending on whether you have irrigation, depending on the moisture, depending on what your, your standards are. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're trying to encourage not just necessarily the wheat free lawn, but we're looking for other plants in there to help with the, this pollinator, pollinator issue. Right. Mm -hmm. um, one more on fertilizer. Joanne from Proctor wants to know if it's safe to use Miracle Grow on vegetable plants. Well, it's a synthetic. It's a synthetic fertilizer. And it just depends again on your growing standards. I mean, you'll have healthier plants and they'll look better, but. Yeah. You know, and it's a synthetic, it's, it's a salt, so you just want to make sure that it, it isn't on the fruit itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times they encourage you foliar feeding, just pour it over the top of the plant. So in every situation with a synthetic fertilizer, 
in my opinion, that should be down in the soil and then washed into the soil mm -hmm. surface. Then uh, there's so many benefits to the organics in the soil, but to give you a flush and to add a little nitrogen, uh, it's certainly going to be helpful for the plant. Mm -hmm. But okay. uh, no problem with vegetables as long as you're not applying directly onto the uh, fruiting portion of the plant. All right, there you have it. Okay, we'll have more questions coming up. But uh, we want to talk about an early season crop grown in a very different way than most of your fruits and veggies. Here's a look at how mushrooms can be raised for a fresh spring meal. You need oak logs or sugar maple logs. We do maple syrup, so it's in the winter time and that's you know the time when we like to work in the woods anyway. What you do is cut the logs into lengths that aren't too heavy. You uh, bring them in, you're supposed to let them set for two weeks, and then you drill holes. You buy spawn. It's a Wisconsin company that uh, sends the materials up here. Probably 50 to 75 holes in each log. And then you insert the spawn with a special tool. And then you have to put wax on each one. And then you just let them sit for a year. So they, um, ha it has to grow inside the log so that it fruits after a year. And they uh, fruit in the spring naturally because it's wet. This year has just been a spectacular year for mushrooms. And so they, um, they have been fruiting now for about three weeks. The mycelium is actually the, the parent um, and the mushroom is the fruit. So the mycelium infiltrates the fibers of the log, takes the nutrients out, and so there's all sorts of you know little fibers inside the log. And then the fruiting is the mushroom and then they uh, give out uh, spawn to make more mushrooms from the fruit. So that's their life cycle. We disrupt it because we take them and eat them. And then we uh, cut the mushrooms probably every two days and store them in a cooler. This one is a really pretty one. It's got a dark, nice color. This is about the size I like to um, harvest them. They're really a good, high quality uh, product. And people know what they are too, you know, they, they like them. It's early, you know, you've got greens and you've got asparagus, but we wanted to add something else at that early part of the market before the snap peas and the beans and all the you know regular stuff comes in. Shiitakes are kind of unique with uh, the log growing. And I, I love it because you don't have to weed them. They just grow, they're pretty tough. They don't have a lot of uh, natural pests and you do it in the springtime when, uh, early spring when they're dormant and there's nothing much else you can do. You do maple syrup and, and the mushroom logs and that's about it. Well, the location is in a stand of trees. It needs to be cool and shady. And David said that the mushrooms can be fried in butter and used later in the season. You can freeze them that way after you've fried them in butter. I had some of those. They were delicious. Mm. I love good. that clip. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I like the part about no weeding. Weeding. No weeding. <laughs> I, know. Yeah. I love that part, too. And if you mm. like mushrooms, mm. Mm. Yes. those yeah. are great. In butter, that's, that's in part butter. of yeah. butter. Anything in butter, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK, we have more questions piling up here. Um, what measures are available to protect trees from yellow-bellied sapsuckers? Mm. Well, uh, my <laughs> children used to take Your their, little, used they, to. My, their little BB gun after uh -huh. it, and you know they would chase it away. And it, I mean, it seemed to work. They seemed to learn from it, but right, um, right. not. But can BB you gun. can you put anything like a chicken wire or anything on them? Well, they're, they're migratory, you know, and you get yeah. a big flock of them. So I think if you see that first row, mm -hmm. which the mm -hmm. tree can tolerate mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. of damage, and it, they are actually sucking the sap. They're yeah. a little different than a woodpecker after the insects. But make sure you get like a screen or a hardware oh, mesh sure. around mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. they, they tend to follow on and then they can do a lot of a damage. A lot of damage. So, mm -hmm. so a thinner mesh th uh, or a... Well, something like hardware, hardware yeah, cloth, rigid hardwood cloth, rigid cloth. Hardwood yeah, cloth sure. which yeah. is quarter inch square, okay. galvanized, mm -hmm. and they won't get after that, and it won't interfere. And they won't with get the between it, it as far, long as it's far enough out. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, Marianne from Kenwood has, I think, a 15-year-old or 5-year-old peace lily. How would I divide it? Well, 
I think you can have, you, when we divide things, we try not to split them in half because you could have total failure. Mm -hmm. But if you start taking parts of it from the outside mm -hmm. and divide those up, start them small, it's less stressful. And then if those, those flourish, then you have more and then you don't worry so much about splitting the other one. But it can be pretty traumatic yeah. if you divide it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of the bulb, I think. Yeah. But they have these little bulblets if mm -hmm. you can pull right. those off or on the pull outside. Those out. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. might be easier. And then less. Spring or fall, do you think? We've done it either time, but the mm -hmm. sh and the shock is much less on a smaller part of it than the mm -hmm. whole thing. That's mm -hmm. massive sure. shock. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mary Ann also is wondering about those flowering white trees around. Are they flowering crab trees? Well, it, more than likely they are if, mm -hmm. they're, if they're large in stature. There's some beautiful plums out there that have mm -hmm. white blossoms mm -hmm. too, but uh, snowdrift is a variety. If you want a magnificent white flowering crab apple that's good and hardy in this area, snowdrift is a appropriately named beautiful, beautiful tree, beautiful be bird. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Martha from Duluth has a weed moving through the lawn. It's got a little white flower in the spring, only is in sunny areas. We took a look at a picture too, Bob. Oh. We weren't able to get the picture up on the air, but, um, and I think you thought that might be a wild violet of It has sort. a very distinct violet-shaped leaf mm -hmm. to it, and uh, most violets have a blue color. Uh, but uh, there are m several varieties that are actually have white color, but it, has, it is in the violet family, very distinctive. And did she want to know how to get rid of it? Yes. Oh, we're trying to keep all these things. <laughs> <laughs> violet, uh, that group is a challenge and you'll have to be very selective. If you're going to use herbicides, you're going to be very selective of the type of material because a lot of the more common materials will not uh, take care of plants in the violet family, mm. including cre Creeping Charlie. So. Sure. Oh. You have to be a little bit more sophisticated. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. Thanks. We'll have a few more questions coming up. But in this week's tour, some gardeners who do a lot of overwintering of favorite plants, and they've beautified their outdoor space together for nearly 50 years. Well, welcome to our garden, uh, Glenn and Erna Peterson. We live at 215 Garden Street. We have lived here for 49 years. The zinnias are state fair zinnias and um, I buy seedling plants. And then there are also calla lilies and they are all yellow. Our effort is to have a blurge of color every two weeks. They have become uh, pretty much a staple in the garden, in the front garden here because they are so colorful and tall. These are King Humbert is the particular variety. More of an orangey red, and sort of like a feather. They're just such a majestic plant and showy and really easy to grow. And they multiply like gangbusters. So you've always got a supply. I need to lift the bulbs in the fall, dry the bulbs and store them in the basement. Can of bulbs, uh, ones that are viable for planting are usually uh, about like that. And they tend to be um, sort of like sweet potatoes. They grow uh, long. We like the white begonias because that sets off all the color and defines our nice curved lines, which we established the old fashioned way with garden hoses. We grow our own geraniums, which is why we can have so many. I take shoots, five, six inch shoots off the end of stalks and rip them in water in a jar and then plant them in four inch pots and grow them all winter in the basement on a plant stand. And geraniums, as you know, will do with little water. The light pink is one called morbaka. It's a favorite Swedish geranium. This is aptly called rose splash. These are pretty much a staple in our garden. Annual salvia, Victoria blue. Even with the potentilla down at the bottom there, it get, get, gets cut down and comes up fresh. Three, four inches from the ground. We work together, so I hold it together and he whacks it and then it just goes right into the bag. So it click, click, click. You guys have a system down there. We that. have yeah. a system, oh, yeah. yep. We need each other. Its common name is Angel's Trumpet. One of the neat things about that is nighttime. Uh, it's fragrant all the time, but for some reason at night, that fragrance is just intoxicating over the whole deck. We have to bring it in, of course. It's a tropical plant. We actually have four of those plants, and they're called 
orchid cactus. November 1st, we can go without a killing frost because we live so close to the lake and not up on the hill. So we really can extend our, and we just hate to cut anything down that's blooming and lovely. This is a cooperative effort. We both are in it all the way. It's another excuse to get out, fresh air, exercise, sleep well at night. Well, they have done some beautiful things in their yeah. yard and uh, been, been working side by side for a long time, so they kind of you know, know the routine, I think. <laughs> yeah, I love that color and the progression of color, and, and that's all great. We've been trying to emphasize habitat for pollinators. Right, mm -hmm. spring, they, summer, fall. They mm -hmm. got the right idea? Yeah, they do. All right. Okay, we have some more questions. Uh, Myrna from West Duluth, who is wondering, how do I dispose of barberry bushes? Well, in the country, we'd just burn them. You know, we'd have a bonfire, and but I don't know if in town. And and they are on the endangered. Town, it is, it is. It? Recently on the endangered. No, no on the, the no. I'm sorry. Recently on the invasive. Yes, invasive. yes, yes. 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 Mm -hmm. so not endangered. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> There's the opposite. Yeah. Uh -huh. No. Yeah, getting rid of them, disposing them. You know, you can always. Um, you could certainly bury them. I think it's the berries that are so prolific, and the birds oh. pick up. Okay. And that's how they're getting spread. So I think not the root material. No, even okay. deep into a compost pile or burning would work. But mm -hmm. I'm not so mm -hmm. sure about doing that in town. Yeah, I don't know either. No. So now that they're on the invasive list, they're not selling them anymore. No. Well, there are a couple of varieties that are sterile. Oh yeah, some of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the newer varieties. Okay. They're introducing sterile varieties, but mm -hmm. some of our real common ones that were and so the hardy beautiful. ones. And the hardy the ones. The hardier, mm -hmm. the more invasive ones are much more hardy, but they are. Okay. That's right. Those have all been pretty much eliminated. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Bob from Cloquet said his soil tests usually give you the NPK, but how about trace minerals? How do you know if your soil is lacking Ooh. trace minerals? And then what can you do if they're deficient in trace minerals? That's a good question. Well, yeah. wouldn't, but you can get more information from the university. You they can, can if you want something specific. Mm -hmm. the, the only place, now you're familiar with peat and peat mm -hmm. ground in the mm -hmm. Zim area. Mm -hmm. If you're on total peat soil, you have a big issue with trace. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're on a mineral soil, not much of an issue at all because mm -hmm. it's required such small amounts and there are 13 yeah, of these small. little traces. Mm -hmm. And so that's not gonna be an issue for you unless sometimes you're really managing a piece of ground very intensely and you're pulling a lot of nutrient off. If you suspect those kind of deficiencies, say in, in iron, a molybdenum, a sulfur, you can get those specific tests if you suspect that. Okay. Most cases, not a problem. If you're on mineral soil, mm -hmm. if you're on peat, if you're on peat, it's totally mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. And then you can get uh, synthetic fertilizers that include all of those yep. trace nutrients. Yep. All right, great information. Um, Rochelle from Hibbing has an azalea that's three years old, and has buds but has never bloomed. It is protected from deer. Why isn't it blooming? That's a hard. I, 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 that seems unless it's a sunlight issue and location, location, mm. location. Yeah, I think so. Vigor. She just doesn't have. You, right. You got to get that plant to grow vigorously. Lots of leafy material. Mm -hmm. It could be low nutrients in the soil. It could be sunlight, as you propose. Mm -hmm. The location itself. So, uh, she might look for another low, another spot for it, or acidifying the soil too. Oh, right, oh. right, right, right. Got to drop the pH down yep. about four or five. They five. do like acid, yeah. a little yeah, more acid. Yeah, they do. Yes, mm -hmm. they do. So uh, she's just not getting plant vigor. Otherwise, she'd be getting some of that bloom. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Excellent, excellent information. All right, well in this week's Grow and Show, more spring blooms shared by viewers from Clam Lake to Grand Rapids, and some pictures to evoke what's to come. Scott Smith of Hayward took the advice of our expert Bob Olin when he planted these chestnut crab trees for pollinators three years ago, and he's glad he did, since delicious fruit and great early bloom has been the result ever since. The spring blooms on the crabapple tree Jerry B. planted in Angora are profuse and always a welcome sign in June. Another bountiful beauty of a tree blooming in the gardens of Evan and Rachel Long in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, where they also enjoy early allium blooms and the sweeping soft petals of their white bleeding heart. Janice McDougall of Clam Lake, Wisconsin was pleasantly surprised by this swallowtail butterfly on her allium while out weeding recently in the hosta bed. And Don and Nancy Larson of Washburn share photos of last season's gardens 
where an array of hostas come up and various blooms emerge, including bright lilies and lacy astilbes, while the fairies play nearby in their own boxed garden of blue. Please share your garden bounty and beauty by sending pictures to greatgardening at wdse.org so we can show what you grow. Keep those photos coming in. We anticipate a whole slate of great garden images as we head into the heart of the season. This is our final show of the season until harvest time when we're back for our Harvest Moon special. That's on September 19th. And in the meantime, uh, we want people to keep an eye on our website and our Instagram page as we update what we're up to over the summer and into early fall. We'll be out uh, doing a, a lot more um, recording of gardens and stuff for next season and for this fall. Deb, uh, things going to slow down a little bit now at the greenhouse? Well, we're planning for next year. That's We're already okay. into next year. Wow. We're bulking our perennials. Wow. We're doing that kind of stuff now. And now you said you can get out in the garden and out yeah. of the greenhouse, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And Bob, uh, we know you don't slow down, so tell us about some of the things you're going to be harvesting well, soon. Well, we're just beginning. First, we're going to start by doing a little replanting. Yeah. Right? Oh, right, right. So we've got right. something for the harvest show in September. Oh, right. But uh, just joking there. But uh, no, we st we're starting to get uh, very busy. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as crops, warm season crops begin to come in, we'll be doing some marketing through our farmer's market. We'll there. look for you at the farmer's market in Duluth. And uh, thank you so much for all the enthusiastic responses to the questions. Our area gardeners are so lucky to have your, your expertise, you guys. We really appreciate it. Want to thank our phone volunteers as well. And of course, we want to say thank you to all of you who called in and all of our viewers out there. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the season and enjoy the garden. Mm -hmm.